Welcome, welcome everyone. We'll take a few minutes for others to join. I'm very eager for our conversation today because the well being of students of color are directly impacted by so many things, including the external systems through which they have to navigate as they grow, learn, live, and socialize. In fact, there's like sense of belonging, feelings of twinship, sense of likeness um, found or not found in their environments have such a cumulative impact on their mental health their self-concept, ultimately their life trajectories. We know especially trauma, including racism and oppression, even changes their physiology, rendering them vulnerable to a myriad of risks and challenges. So let's dig into all of this and more. Hello, I'm Josephine Kim. I'm Senior Lecturer on Education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Welcome to today's Education Now webinar. Our series provides actionable insights and strategies to shape new approaches to challenges in education. Please submit your questions for our panel by using the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You'll also find closed caption access right there. We have a lot to talk about today, so let's welcome our guests. We have Sean Jinwright, who is Jerome T. Murphy Professor of the Practice here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. We have Jamie Banks, Deputy Chief in the Office of Prevention and Intervention with the School District of Philadelphia, and Kalila Moon, Executive Director and CEO of Drive Change, an organization that supports young people who have been formerly incarcerated. Welcome, Jamie, Kalila, and Sean. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Good to be here. Good to be here. So great to have you. So great to see you, everyone. Sean, we're actually going to start with you. You are a scholar. You've also been a youth development professional for more than 30 years. Kudos to you. Could you briefly tell us about this healing-centered engagement practice you developed in recent years? You know, what is it? Why do we need it? How does it work? Well, Joe, you already, you've already said that I've been doing this for 30 years, so you, you, you're telling my age, I guess. Um, <laughs> You know, I, for years and years, I've been working with young people uh, of color, specifically African American youth, and recognized early on that the way that we were thinking about trauma uh, that young people bring, particularly African American young people bring, was very myopic, was very narrowly focused, um, and its response was narrowly focused. And um, about ten years ago, I've been writing about how we need to really broaden our understanding of what causes trauma among African-American young people, but also how we respond to it. And so the term healing-centered engagement uh, was a way in which we can build from our understanding of trauma-informed approaches. And while trauma-informed approaches are important to respond to young people, they oftentimes lack the cultural nuance that's important. It oftentimes is focused on the harm and it doesn't necessarily build from their assets. So healing-centered engagement is a perspective of how we see the value and the assets of young people, but it is also a practice saturating with young people with caring, loving relationships that's culturally consistent with who they are um, and, and who they want to become. And, and my work has been about training and supporting people on how to do that. I love it. So this healing-centered engagement, it's also a practice you use at a summer camp that you and your wife created called Camp Akili. Um, you've described the camp as a field of dreams. How do you actually use the practice there? Well, when we, when we created the camp we, uh, years ago, uh, we thought that it was going to be sort of a leadership camp, but we recognized early on that many of the young people that came to the summer camp were coming with various forms of trauma from experiences with the police, with deep shame on their racial and ethnic identity, with shame of their from their parents' substance abuse. And, and so when we created the camp, we weren't sure what we were what we would expect. But what we realized is by building that camp, it was like, you know, people came because they felt that they they left that camp with a sense of wholeness and a sense of purpose and a sense of um, a sense that they can sort of contribute to society. And so the, that camp we've been doing for 30 years and more recently had an extraordinary opportunity to uh, expand our work in Philadelphia. And one of the one of the uh, affirming uh, uh, experiences about that is that the same spirit 
the same sort of sanctuary of belonging that we created in Oakland is now in Philadelphia. And so we're, we're excited about this opportunity to continue to build and, and use healing centered engagement as a tool to spread across cities in the country. And here is someone who can speak directly to that experience. Kalila, we're so happy you're here. You actually attended Camp Achille in California as a teenager yourself. I mean, how did the experience really influence you? Wow. I mean, it, 30 years ago, Sean, am I dating myself too? <laughs> <laughs> um, but the experience, uh, it, it made me who I am today. The way that I move through the world as a Black woman um, uh, is because of, you know, those who've invested in me and because of Camp Akili. Camp Akili um, taught me how to not only love myself, but my community and to pour back into my community. Um, it, it, it allowed me to see the world um, and dream more expansively. I actually think about my first time out of the country, and it was with my Camp Akili family. We traveled to West Africa. And so to be able to know that, you know, I'm bigger, my my future is more than just, you know, my the, the radius of my block in, in Oakland, where I was born and raised, and my future could have gone any any direction, right? Um, but that Camp Akili and the folks at, at, at that organization um, with Sean and Nedra, they've poured into me, they invested in me. And that's the reason why I am here today. Um, I have people in my life who um, you, when, when the investment was taken away, the impact that that might've had on them. And so it's important now that me as a leader um, at Drive Change, I, I think I am very intentional about healing and lifting up healing and uh, restorative justice and helping my young people know that they're more than just their trauma, their zip codes, right? All the things that mm -hmm. Sean um, and Nedra have instilled in the young people that have come through Camp Akili. Love this. Thank you so much for sharing that. Kalila, the sense of belonging and community that you experienced at this camp, unfortunately, as you were growing up, wasn't something that was accessible to everyone in your family. And I wonder if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about your um, cousin's experience and how that ultimately influenced your career. Yeah, I mean, I think about every day when I when I come to work, I do this work for my cousin and people in my life that have been impacted by the justice system. But um, I talk a lot about the power of investment and where where I am in my life. And it's because of uh, organizations like a Flourish Agenda, uh, Leadership Excellence at the time. Um, and my cousin um, was removed from his community, right? He was removed from the folks that were investing in him and our lives um, have gone different paths, right? And so unfortunately, you know, he has been in and out of the justice system um, and, you know, suffered from some other uh, substance use abuses um, and things of that nature. But I, every day I wake up, I wish that I can do this I wish that I could do what I'm doing for the young people for him, right? And so um, it is a, a direct example of when you remove something that is important, especially for uh, individuals who have been, um, who are marginalized, come from communities that are marginalized, um, especially black and brown folks when we, when it's not just a saying that it takes a village to raise a family, right? It's a practice. And it is necessary for us to, um, to lift up and build up our young people so that they can succeed because a lot of folks weren't given the first and second chances. Um, and again, uh, uh, my my cousin is just a one example of someone who when they're not invested in and they don't have someone saying that you are more than just that and you know you don't have to live the life that your mom and dad have, le have lived um what that can then result in thank you so much for sharing that we really appreciate it um switching gears to jamie uh, last summer philadelphia became the first city to host camp Achille on the east coast um, and educators in your school district are being trained in this practice of healing centered engagement what has been the impact of all of this it's been uh pretty amazing we uh almost a year ago this time last year we started planning camp um and um, identified schools to participate in the adult training. We made sure the linkage between the camp and the adults, uh, it, it was streamlined. So adults in the schools of the kids that were going to the camp were the adults that we trained. Um, and so the impact has been just having more open conversation, kids feeling heard in a way in which they said, I never thought, um, first of all, I didn't realize I wasn't being heard in the first place. And now 
I, I have words and, and tools, and I know there's adults that care about me. Um, and so it's just been really powerful to the, to the point that this summer, we're not having one camp, we're working on two camps. Um, and so, you know, this has been an amazing experience for um, the district as well as, you know, the kids in our city. The rest of Pennsylvania, Jamie is coming. Um, mm -hmm. So Jamie, what are some key takeaways from your experience that could help other school districts and communities? Because okay. I imagine, you know, educators, administrators, they're here. And what I'm really appreciating from what you're saying is sometimes kids don't even know to know what they're missing. And it seems like this experience is really highlighted for them, perhaps what schools can actually be all the time. Right? Yeah. So what are some key takeaways you might have? Well, it's more than just schools. Uh, what we have done with this process as we've started in the school building, but we're expanding outside the school walls. What do I mean by that? We are talking with our city behavioral health providers, um, our department of behavioral health, pulling them in. This, this can't be a school thing. This has to be a community thing, right? So that kids can feel this in schools. And then as they leave and go to extracurricular activities, whatever they do in the weekend, whatever they do in the neighborhood, we're starting to, 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 to branch this out. And more importantly, we are providing adults outside of just the clinical framework with tools to help our kids. What we've seen since the pandemic is an increase in mental health need. This increase was occurring prior to the pandemic. We have to, we have to say that. And so, yes, there's a need for clinicians. Yes, there's a need for therapy, but there's also a need to equip all of those folks who are just pouring into our youth with the right tools so that they can help in an upstream way so that things don't build, right? And so we collectively are coming together um, as, as a group um, to, to, to help. And the adults are also going through their own healing while they're going through this. So it's just not the healing of our youth. It's also the healing of the adults that we don't always pay attention to. Yes, they're so interconnected, aren't they? You know, depending on the emotional and social capacity that we have as adults, it actually reverberates onto our work with children and, and young people. So I love that. So we actually are now um, in the Q&A process. Would love to engage our audience with any questions that they might have. But again, I really appreciate this idea of it has to be the family, it has to be the schools, it has to be the communities working together um, really in one accord. So here's a question for us, um, perhaps Jamie or Sean, could you say more about the role a classroom teacher can have in creating the sense of belonging that feels so important in the healing process? Yeah, I mean, I could take a, a, a first shot at it. I mean, I think the first, um, the, the role is is really creating a sense of, of belonging. And that and it means that the teacher has to practice his or her own sort of healing. Um, it means that the teacher should be encouraging students to practice an emotional vocabulary. That is, how is it that I'm actually modeling the capacity to name my emotions and supporting with supporting students to feel safe in their classroom and doing the same? Like and, that. And, and as a mental, oh, oh I'm yes, sorry. sorry. So it's an authentic relationship, right? An authentic connection to yield what John just shared. Yes, as a backdrop to any type of healing, that authentic relationship. Just knowing that somebody has your back actually matters quite a bit. Um, and this idea of naming your emotion, that actually scientifically is proven. It engages both sides of our brains when we stop to actually name what it is that we're feeling. And in that process actually helps us to manage our emotions better. I love that. So Leila, how can we engage parents and caregivers in solving this trauma or, or partnering with us to do this work? Yeah, I think it's about um, informing them about the, what's out there for um, for their young people, right? So a lot of times our parents don't know um, because they are, you know, everyone's one track mind, you know, nine to five, go to work. Um, and so, uh, you know, what is it that if we know that there are resources that are out there for our young people, let's put it in the hands of our parents, you know, uh, presenting to them at our PTA meetings, our community boards. Um, our faith-based institutions, I always like to say, I like to go where all the aunties and the, the, the aunt, aunts and aunties are, right? And the grandmas, like, take me there, right? I want to be in, in that space to talk about what's going on because then they'll pass it on. And innately, we will want our, our young people, the children in our lives to succeed. So it's really about exposure. I love that you brought up faith uh, communities. What are the approaches, Sean? 
what are the approaches we can use to invite and really involve our communities, including houses of worship, as a means to have them practice, right, this healing-centered engagement with us? Yeah, I mean, I you know, I've been saying for quite some time that we need to engage the entire ecosystem where young people work, live, and play. And that means it's, it's in schools, but it's also in community-based organizations, and it's also in faith communities. And I think the degree to which we can actually get faith leaders uh, to understand the, the, the importance of healing, uh, the, the, uh, to get faith leaders and congregations to actually get out, of the, get out of the church and get into the community and work with young people, but do it in a way that's really authentic and creates a space of belonging. And the more that folks, the adults, right? I think this part of a secret sauce is that the adults have to engage in their own healing. And because it's not just that I gotta go do this for these young people so that they can be okay. It's that when I'm in that process and when I take up my own sense of healing from things that I've that happened to me in my own life, that that gives me more currency and power to then have an authentic, powerful relationship with that adult. And that's sometimes scary for adults, but the faith and faith communities, um, if you use the healing-centered engagement practices, um, I have a new book out called The Four Pivots, which is a way in which the faith community can actually practice healing-centered leadership. But, but by doing that, we are able to increase the capacity to saturate young people's lives with well-being and healing. Love that. Jamie, I wonder if you might have some thoughts on this, because I know you're also very big on getting the community involved. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just pulling them in. I mean, in, in this next go around that we're doing to continue this work, again, we're looking at multiple different organizations and agencies and having them train and not just train in isolation, have them go through HEE with other uh, parties from other groups that we are, are training to start forming that, that community and that connection. Um, and so, again, this is something that I think has to be done collectively um, versus in isolation and, and really in a collaborative process. And there's definitely collective healing to do, right? Um, that so many things, it's not an individual, you know, necessarily, but there is so much collective wounding and trauma um, that really fits with this as well. So there's someone here who says, you know, I, she's wondering or they're wondering uh, whether the terms healing centered is um, similar to trauma informed. Um, and this uh, audience member actually says it feels much more strength based, if you will, um, and might actually be a good replacement for the trauma informed. What are your thoughts on that? Sean, I wonder if we can go to you with this. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I coined the term healing center really as a as an alternative to trauma informed. And in the article that I wrote, when the young man told me, you know, hey, Dr. G, I'm more than just my trauma, right? It, it really shifted me. It shifted how I thought about the role of trauma, that young people shouldn't be labeled or understood by the worst thing that ever happened to them. And so if that's the case, then can we have another term that's more asset based? And not just a term that's asset based, but an approach that's asset based, that I appreciate the assets that the young people bring to my school, that they bring to my community organization. And I appreciate their culture, their ethnic culture, their, their, their ethnic identity, their gender culture, but that there's a complete way that we're focusing on the assets of young people as a strategy for their healing and well being. That. I think one of the mistakes that adults make is always kind of assume fragility first uh, before we actually look into their resilience and strength. And I really appreciate that. There's another question for anyone who would like to take this up. Are there ways that we can bring this type of work, these types of practices into the policy landscape um, so that it can, on a systemic level, really impact, for example, the you know educational system? What do you think? I'm seeing lots of nods. Should we go to Kalila first? Sorry, I heard it, but then I, this this question, I'm reading the question, but. <laughs> oh, no problem, we've got a lot here. Uh -huh. So are there ways that we can embed or have this infiltrate into the policy level so that systems can actually be shifted? 
Definitely. I mean, I think this can this can be added in various different ways. We can be we can go off and talk talk to our well here in New York, you know, our council members, our state assembly members, and, and lift up um, uh, mental health, healing centered work, restorative justice work, and how do we ensure that this is work that is placed in curriculums within the school system? Right. There are ways in which that we can do it that they are specifically philanthropically. How do we make sure that the dollars are being um, uh, provided to organizations within um, New York City so that we can do this work, right? Because it's not um, it's not free and people should be paid what they, and they pay their worth, right? Um, and to, exactly right, Jamie, pay people what they're worth. Um, and that's a whole separate webinar. Um, <laughs> but I do think that it's important for us to, um, you know, I always say that our, our budget is our, we say our budgets are our value statements at, at Drive Change. And we put money towards the things that we care about. And if we at the top and our policies and our and we're advocating for mental health and healing and really restoring our communities, you will see that trickle down um, in the school systems. You will see it trickle down in the dollars that are being poured into our communities. Communities will, will begin to not feel like they're lacking of, lacking of employment, lacking of food, all these things that have direct impacts on why even the young people that I serve um, are being are being arrested in the first place. Thank you for that. Jamie, Sean? I will say in January, I spoke to Pennsylvania House representatives and talked about HCE, Healing Centered Engagement, and what we're doing and how it needs to be supported and how I shouldn't as a school district have to guess if I'm going to get funding in order to continue this work. It needs to be embedded in a way in which I can rely on it so that can continue to build. Um, so yes, there's definitely ways to, to bring this into policy. Yeah, it yeah. feels like the best way to institutionalize things. Yes, go ahead, Sean. Yeah, um, you know, most policy is driven by a focus on prevention or problems or some pathology of young people. And, and a healing-centered strategy would say, let's focus on relationships, let's, let's invest in assets, and let's, let's focus on a possible future, which is a very different policy framework. And so part of what we're doing is trying to encourage policymakers to shift their thinking about shifting resources, to, to create policy that's much more asset driven, that it's not only about solving problems and seeing young people as problems, but really investing in, 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 their, in their relationships and, and investing in their, their possibility. Thank you for that. We touched upon this a little bit, but I see a question here and I think we have some educators and teachers in the audience. Um, are these practices beneficial for teachers, right? Um, in the school community as well? Where should we go, Jamie? I'm my head, but I'm, I'm looking at Sean. Sean. I'm yeah, going to jump course. in because I'm like, of, yes, yes, <laughs> of course. I, everything from teachers to climate staff to custodian, the anyone who is touching, you know, and 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 supporting kids, barbers, hairdressers. I mean, like we can go on the list, but yes, and really thinking about uh, what Sean's response before about really how how to have that authentic relationship, but also do that work for, for themselves as well, so that um, they can really be implementing the practices in their classrooms and communities. Yeah. John? Yeah, Joe, Joe most, most school districts, the only way, the, the only way the adults in those systems can actually get some time to, to heal or to be well is to take a sick day. You gotta be sick mm -hmm. to get well. And so there aren't really ongoing systems of support to support the, the mental and behavioral health of the adult workforce. And so healing center and engagement says it's normal. Let's normalize behavioral mental health in the classroom. Let's have 10 minutes a day where we do emotional check-ins. When the adults are invested in their own healing and well-being, that can that that just that alone means this is not just another program. This is not yet another curriculum that we're slamming into school districts. It's a way of, it's a way of being that actually uh, creates wellness for the, the, the adult staff as well as the young people. This is not just, hey, we should do social emotional learning. Hey, we should do SCL today. It's not that. It's a mindset that for the for the adults, the adults need SEL. And then that makes it much more important for for the young people, much more powerful for the young people as well. I see. Oh, go ahead, Kalila. 
I'm just thinking about my own experience um, leading an organization and, you know, the importance of me being able to tap and one, recognize the trauma that I even have um, as a black woman. Right. Um, and, and and tapping into that and, and you know, then being intentional about lifting up, uh, uh, creating spaces where my staff can address their own trauma. We are, you know, creating healing circles that we can have conversations when things aren't going the ways and directions in which we want and why, you know, why those things might have even come up for us, right? Because we are then um, asking our young people to show up in a certain way. And we, you know, we haven't even addressed what we're going through. And and, and I thought about, you know, as, uh, you know, I, I was one of the first young people to, I was the first young person to, to facilitate a camp at Keeley back in Oakland. And even when I was leading that, that camp, we had to have all of our counselors come in. They had to sit and go through the exact training that, you know, um, the young people would go through. So they knew that experience. Right. And a lot of that's like you were talking about, Jamie came up and it was still, you know, it came up even because we wanted to ensure that we talked about, we addressed what, what you, your own issues then prior to um, the young person going through their own experience. So, you know, it's really important that we um, focus on that the person that is kind of leading the flock, if you will, or teaching, right? Um, because, you know, they need to know that you are human beings too, and you also have gone through some things. Yeah. Yeah, so true. You know, it, it leads us right into this next question. So healing is often an ongoing journey. It's not something where you could just kind of arrive in the moment, you know, at one time. So how can we convey, especially to young people, that this uh, healing is a bit of a journey, right? Any thoughts there? Sean, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I mean, I think you don't have to convince or convey it, right? Because human beings have a natural tendency to recover to to recover well-being right i think what's important is to create the space for young people to discover themselves mm -hmm. um and creating that space young people already know the challenges that they have in their lives you don't have to say hey you should be well no i was hurt when this teacher said this to me no i was hurt when the police officer did this to me no i was i'm embarrassed that my mother's a substance we young people are already aware critically aware of the trauma that they carry it's just that the space in schools or sometimes in the community based organization isn't isn't soft enough to hold and care for that trauma mm -hmm. right and so what we're what healing centered engagement says is that Let's create these sanctuaries of possibility for young people to bring their hurt and harm and it be loved upon, right? And it be loved upon. And so that loving upon, when, it, when you bring that precious harm, um, allows young people to feel safe and then they leave with that, right? And they, 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 they have that capacity together collectively then to heal themselves. It's not, you know, we're not saying that you should be, a, we're not saying, you know, we, we need therapists but we also have to democratize access, right? And folks, and that could be teachers and parents and everyone in the community can participate in the well-being of young people. Yes, and we also need therapeutic conversations in the absence of therapy all around us, right? Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Well, maybe as our final question, going back to the health practices for adults and on a personal level for you, how do you fill your own cup in doing this incredibly challenging yet profound and I'm sure enjoyable work. Um, what are some practices that maybe you use individually and what do you recommend? How do you fill your own cup? You can start with Jamie. Oh, this is something I talk about often um, and I have to remind myself often um, as being doers, we often do a lot of doing and we don't, <laughs> we don't set ourselves down, right? And so everything you know, from small things of, of me making sure that I kind of touch into what am I like grateful for, thankful for on a daily basis, right? And, and, and being really intentional about that time to think about that, to really also identifying time where it's just me. It's just going to be me and I'm shutting everything out because I need, I need some me time. Um, and, and trying to be very intentional um, and boundaried when I, I do that um, are things that I continue to, to work on as well as uh, implement in my life. Human beings first before human doings. Huh? Kalila, what about you? 
Yeah, I would have to echo what Jamie said, but then also, um, you know, I'll surround myself with people who um, to lean on. Someone told me once that you are you're you are only alone if you choose to be. And so oftentimes in this work, especially when you're leading an organization, you, you feel lonely um, and it's lonely at the top, but you can lean on others. Um, and so I, I will do that when necessary. Go for a walk when, you know, when necessary. Uh, dance. <laughs> I love I love music anywhere from gospel to I don't know Megan the Stallion I I love it all <laughs> let me say something from Oakland too I don't know. but you know so whatever it is that makes me that brings joy in my life that's the thing that I'm seeking. Um, a, a colleague once a long time ago told me um, that we all all have to learn to give from our excess not our essence. And that means one, we have to we have to recognize, do we have excess? And if we don't have excess, how do I get it? But when we get from our essence, that's limited. And so I think we have to nurture that practice in ourselves to understand when we're giving from our excess or if or we're giving from our essence and, that, and to make decisions about making sure we have enough excess to give. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And educator Josh Shipp said, every student is one caring adult away from being a successful story. And I just want to thank you for being that caring adult uh, today. So everyone, thank you for joining us from across the globe. And thanks to our guests, Jamie Banks, Kalila Moon, and HGSC's very own Sean Jin Wright. Thanks. And I'm Josephine Kim signing off. Thank you. Thanks. I think we can now go to that Wait, other right? Zoom link. Oh, okay. Yeah. See you there.